Good morning. It's Monday, the second of September, and this is Govind Raj Ati Raj, headquartered and broadcasting and streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital. Before I start, happy September, and August is of course flown by. And September seems like a pretty busy month for most people I know of, including a spate of conferences and perhaps heading into conference time and season for the rest of the year. And of course, also the start of the big festivals. The take, grin and bear it. Mergers and acquisitions are not new in the Indian landscape, but few have or will be as public and consumer-facing as Air India and Vistara, least for the social media noise the inevitable problems could create. Now, products and services have seen owners change all the time in the country. This could range from soaps and medicines to cement and steel. Service could include hotels to airlines, like for example Kingfisher buying Air Deccan or Jet buying Sahara Airlines. Both fairly large deals for their time were announced in 2007, and then both acquirer and obviously acquired airlines have since shut down. Now, Air India has announced that Vistara will cease to exist in its current form from November 12th this year, a logical culmination of a process that started in November 2022. The fact is that the Tatas now own Air India, and there is not much logic in continuing two separate brands and airlines from a management point of view. It's a bit of a catch-22. The Tatas owned 51%, while Singapore Airlines owned 49% in Vistara. And as the merger goes through, or is expected to grow through by the year end, Singapore Airlines will own about 25% in the combined entity, which includes Air India and Vistara. Now, the biggest problem, of course, is that there is a sharp difference between the two products. Vistara is more premium and preferred by business travelers. Air India is less premium and may be preferred more by leisure travelers. And also something that many people actively avoid at all costs, particularly international. Though it's a full-service carrier serving hot meals, and I mean domestic particularly, versus let's say an Indigo where food is pre-ordered and paid for. The premiumness can be subjective, of course, but the fares reflect the difference. Business class fares on the two airlines on a Mumbai Delhi sector could vary by as much as 50 percent, or even more at times, or at least at similar departure times. Though I can sense that the airlines now are trying to synchronize fares increasingly, and that is a problem. Like for like, the experience on most Air India flights is not the same, even if the aircraft is newer, like the Airbus A350 on some domestic routes. Though that does help balance things out somewhat. So, what could the airlines do? And more on that shortly. So, let me quote a simple example. Boarding procedures on Air India, for example, are totally random and chaotic, almost like the good old days. While Vistara is orderly and disciplined. For business travelers, this matters. Who also, by the way, do not pay so much importance to food as long as it's competent. Vistara flies to quite a few international destinations, east and west of India, and once again, the experiences can become dramatically different. You could be on an aging, battered, and rattling Air India A320, and a quiet and well turned out A321, both to Singapore, leaving almost an hour or so apart from Mumbai. All this means is that Air India will have a massive problem managing the transition, and while it intends to have as many new aircraft as possible and will do, the interim period will be like a Russian roulette for passengers. Particularly if there is no choice given in the aircraft and the old airline or the airline the way passengers knew it. Now, while all of this is something the Tatas cannot control, I still understand the management imperative to merge. Hopefully, it will communicate, or the combined entities will communicate much better and literally focus half their energy on that. And maybe the pain will not last long. And that brings us to the top stories and themes for the day. The stock markets are now sitting on their longest rally ever. Goods and service tax collections have crossed 175,000 crores again, steady in recent months. GDP slows down as projected in the last quarter. Economists are now revising full-year growth figures downwards. Container cargo companies globally are seeing a bumper year thanks to Middle East tensions, and the perils of merging a 92-year-old airline with a nine-year-old one. This is a core report with Govind Raj Athiraj. The stock market stays strong. The Nifty 50 rose for the 12th consecutive session on Friday, its longest ever rally, even as the markets hit all-time highs again. The BSE Sensex added about 231 points to close at 82,365 in Friday's trade after hitting an all-time high of 82,637 during intraday trade. The Nifty 52 closed higher at 25,235, up about 84 points after hitting an all-time high of 25,268 during intraday trade. 
Wall Street was strong on Friday. The S&P 500, the Nasdaq and the Dow Jones industrial average were all up between half a percent to about one percent. Oil prices are down below $77 a barrel now. Bloomberg reports that oil fell sharply over the weekend as traders priced in expectations that the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries Plus will proceed with previously announced output hikes in the fourth quarter, which means more supply, though the group has warned repeatedly that it could pause or reverse the hikes if necessary. So oil is now quoting, that's Brent crude is now quoting at around $76.93 a barrel, which is much lower than what it was in previous weeks. Brent is, of course, a global crude benchmark, and it's notched its first back-to-back monthly loss this year, with Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley slashing their price forecasts, citing their disappointment demand outlook in China, Bloomberg said. GDP slows down as predicted. India's GDP has slowed in the first quarter of the current financial year to a five-quarter low, an event that was projected and forecast by almost all economists as we discussed in some detail last week. The reason is a continuing decline in agriculture, private consumption and government expenditure. So, during the first quarter of the current fiscal, real GDP grew by about 6.7% against 7.8% in Q4 FY24. That's basically the last quarter of the previous year and 8.2% a year ago. So the question, of course, is the outlook for the coming year, assuming elections, among other factors, slow down spending and consumption in the previous quarter. Which brings me to a question I ponder upon sometimes. Do major elections slow down economies elsewhere in the world, particularly the developed world? I'm not sure of the answer and there may not be a black and white one, but we'll surely leave it to you to ruminate upon today. So last year, the economy grew about 8.2%, a figure that surprised many on the upside. Now, India, of course, is still the fastest growing major economy in the world as China's GDP in the April to June quarter was at 4.7% on a much larger base, of course. Crystal Chief Economist DK Joshi says the slowdown in GDP growth in the first quarter was a foregone conclusion thanks to signs of weak urban consumption, tepid corporate results and a slowdown in government spending. Looking ahead, Crystal says it is seeing initial signs of pickup in rural consumption and also expects private consumption demand to improve this year over an anemic growth of 4% in the previous year. Crystal feels that higher agriculture growth will augment income and lower food inflation will also improve discretionary spending ability. So, what it all means is that Crystal now expects the economy will grow at 6.8% this year. Remember, last year it was 8.2%. GST collections are up. As we talk about overall GDP, let's see if we can glean something from goods and services tax collections. Actually, you can't, at least not much. India collected about 1.75 trillion rupees in GST for the month of August or 175,000 crores. That's up 10% from a year earlier. According to provisional data released by the finance ministry on Sunday, the rise in domestic GST collection was up 9.2%, while from imports, it was up 12.1%. So when we say imports, we mean taxes that are collected on imports like customs and so on. So the August number is related to goods consumed and services availed in the month of July. And that's how it's usually or always released. The previous month, by the way, was 182,000 crores. And March was the big one at 210,000 crores, also being a year end. So in contrast to the previous months, obviously, the numbers are a little down. So if you were to see this over a one-year period, collections seem to be somewhat consistent with one or two big jumps and increases followed by small dips. Container shipping industry sees record volumes high profits. So tensions in the Middle East and the resultant rerouting of traffic, among other reasons, has led to the global container shipping industry seeing profits surge to more than $10 billion in the second quarter on record volumes and rising freight rates after those Red Sea diversions, according to a new analysis quoted by Bloomberg. Net income from the world's major container carriers, including Denmark's AP Moller Maersk and China's Costco shipping, almost doubled from the first three months of the year and topped the almost $9 billion haul from the second quarter of 2023, according to that report released Saturday by industry veteran John McCone, quoted again by Bloomberg. Profits for the current quarter may also show another material increase given how well the market for international goods trade has been holding up, he said. So the last time the industry saw such good times was during the pandemic, thanks to strong consumer demand and obviously massive supply chain disruptions, thanks to COVID. The container shipping industry transports 80% of global merchandise trade. Air India and Vistara keeping passengers happy. 
So a big challenge for Air India as it merges with Vistara will be to try and ensure loyal Vistara passengers do not feel shortchanged as they navigate between the two products. Vistara was launched in 2015 and is thus barely a decade old. Air India was founded in 1932, which makes it 92 years old right now. Obviously, a 92-year-old airline, which has spent roughly 70 years in tight and debilitating government control, merging with a 9-year-old one cannot mean good news. I do intend to follow this merger a little closely, also because aviation interests me and that's something we cover frequently. So I reached out to Ajay Avtani, aviation journalist and editor, live from alounge.com, and you should check it out. And I began by asking him what operational challenges he foresaw for the merger from a passenger experience point of view. I think there will be a lot of confusion that's going to come over the next 60 days or so. I think we are 74 or 73 days away from this merger at this point of time. I think some of the initial confusion is already out there. And a lot of it is going to be dealing with two different brands, right? I mean, people who've already booked the tickets on Vistara will, we are now in a short memory environment, right? People don't have that kind of attention span. So if they don't pay attention to details, at some point in time, these people will receive emails or messages telling them that the Vistara flight numbers have changed into Air India flight numbers. And then they will arrive and they will most probably still see a Vistara uh, livery aircraft and still see aubergine uniform, pantsuit, people serving them in that. So it's going to be a confusion more on the visual aspect, I think, a lot. But if they've lined up everything very well, a lot of things should go out very smoothly. And they still have about 70 days to go with it. So I think the good thing is that the both the airlines operate on the same reservation system, so it should not be problem. Bookings should not be lost in the transition. It's just going to be a lot of people turning up and being confused about if they're boarding an Air India flight or a Vistar flight, which is going to be one and the same thing as of 12th November. So you're saying that the aircraft will still carry the Vistara colors and the in-flight crew will be wearing the same Vistara, except that when I book the ticket, I will have no choice about where I would go. See, yes, this is my interpretation that what will happen is that uh, Vistara will merge into Air India on the night of 11th and 12th of November, right? So as of 12th, everyone who is a Vistara employee will become an Air India employee and so on. But it's going to be impossible to repaint all these aircraft, right, overnight. So what will happen, perhaps, is that over the next one or two years, these aircraft will go into the paint shop and and be recoloring, whatever. Similar thing for the uniforms, right? Uh, it's not, From what I hear from the people involved, uh, nothing is going to be majorly change over the next three to four months. Right after the merger, the first aspect to take care of them for them is the fact that they ride out the Delhi fog season, the North India fog season very well. So I would imagine the schedule will be synced up and a lot of these changes will start maybe three to four months after post-February 2025. I was a frequent flyer of either brand. Would I benefit in any way or perhaps lose something or how are you seeing that? Vistara has already announced that Vistara's frequent flyer program will merge into Air India's loyalty program which is for flying returns. So the good thing is that even if you on the day of the merger let's say an elite member, like the gold or the platinum, for even five more days, you're going to get a one-year extension into the new program. Okay, so because Air India is a member of Star Alliance, it's the better deal for people because now your perks from an Air India gold or an Air India platinum will continue and you can use them on all the other Star Alliance carriers like Singapore Airlines, Lufthansa, United, or whatever else that you you travel on. So that's the benefit. The problem is we, at this point of time, do not know the exact date of when Club Vistara members will transition into, you know, Air India flying returns. They've already started the process of taking approvals from each and every frequent flyer program member. So you would have gotten an email. I got an email. We have linked our accounts. But on the which date exactly will this transition happen? We don't know yet. 
again, operational sort of question. So what are the one or two areas that you feel they need to be careful about so as not to upset flyers? You know, I mean, I'll give you the context, at least from where I'm coming from. There is a perception, including from many of us, that, you know, Vistara was a superior product, particularly for business travelers, and Air India is not. But that's one view. But in general, where do you feel both need to be careful in order to, you know, keep everyone happy? One of the big things that will be is going to be enough customer communication. Okay. So they're just, we're just 48 hours since the announcement really came through. So it's going to be a few days, but a lot of information will trickle out in the coming days. Okay. Air India needs to own upon the fact that they need to communicate very effectively with with startup customers. The second thing, product parity is not going to happen overnight. The good news is, for example, if you booked a Vistara flight, most probably you will not see an Air India aircraft in the next four or six months at least. So if you booked a aircraft which you expected, let's say a life flight bed, you will still get that and so on. So that product quality will not go down immediately at least. But over a period of time, obviously, Air India needs to make sure that the SNB and other aspects, uh, crew training and so on, come to the level of Vistara. That's going to be a long, long battle. It's going to take them years to do that. It's not going to be something that's going to happen overnight. Right, Ajay, thank you so much for joining me. Thanks, Owen. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.